Hey, this is Rush Schlecht, and I'm the senior pastor of Eastside Church, and this is our podcast. I want to thank you for joining us today. I hope this inspires you, hope it builds your faith, and I hope it gives you perspective on how God is moving in your life. Enjoy the message. All right, we've got a special treat this morning. So we have a member of our congregation named Josiane, and she's from Rwanda. And she's had a word uh, from the Lord. And when we say word from the Lord, we don't take that lightly. We believe that when somebody has something that they believe the Lord's given them, it's going to be there for a while. And this has been percolating in Josiane for a number of months. And so we talked about it. We actually met about it several months ago. And we just kind of let it be, whatever the Lord wants to do. And then lately she's felt this pressing to share it with the congregation. So we're going to invite Josiane up here to share it with the congregation, this word that she has. And she actually has an interpreter with her because she'll be delivering the message in Rwandan, right? So why don't you join me up here, Josiane, bring your microphones. Let's welcome them. And then we'll get into the sermon after that. So why don't you come right up here? I know we didn't practice this earlier, so why don't you guys stand right here, and let me make sure your microphones are on. So introduce yourselves. If you could both introduce yourselves, that would be awesome. I'll stand off to the side so you guys have the whole place to yourselves. And let me make sure your mics are on. That one looks good. Let me make sure this one's good. That one looks good, too. So let's see if they're working. Let's let's test these mics out. Why don't you say good morning into the microphone? Good morning, church. All right. okay. Good morning. Uh, yeah. Good morning again. Uh, I will speak in my language, and that's when it's easier for me. And I greet y'all in the name of Jesus. My name is Josiane, for those who doesn't know me, but a lot of people know me, they call me Josie. Uh, uh, my, I'm with Rosie, my friend. She's here to uh, help me to interpret in English. <laughs> Her English is great because she, she speaks better, English better than me. And me too, I can speak English, but not like her. My husband he is an American. I speak great English when I'm with him. <laughs> Thank you so much. In this morning, I'm here uh, giving thanksgiving to God. Because God been with me and, and, and been with my family. Uh, I'm so thankful because I had one of the kids that the devil was about to steal from me. Uh, but God fight for us and uh, God being with us and my kid is very good. Yeah. I thank uh, our pastor here who gave me opportunity to stand here to share the word of God. I, I thank all the people who helped me to pray for this message, uh, including the pastor's wife. Yeah. I thank you, y'all. I believe that even among you, there's some who has some thanksgiving in your heart. 
byonyine kuba wabashe kubyuka ukabona biremeye ugahaguruka ubona biremeye ukabaje driving imodoka yokagera hano for you to to wake up uh, in in a, in a good healthy and to stretch up your hands and it's fine and you drive your car and you got here that is a blessing uh, don't forget that some other people are sleeping in overlake sick or had some hard time and others have lost their loved one and everything like that. For you to be here and to, to be alive and to be speaking and moving and everything, it's fine. That's a miracle. I'm going to share the message of God. Are uh, we going to read in Jonah, book of Jonah? It's Jonah 1. It's Jonah 1, 1, 2, 2. It's now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh that great city and proclaim against it for their weak weaknesses has come up before me and we're going to read in isaiah 55 isaiah 55 6 to 7 says seek inquiry for the require the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. And let him return to the Lord. And he will have love, pity, and mercy for him. And to our God, for he will multiply for him his abundant pardon. I'm, I'm giving you this message. This message goes with the message that God will give me that I can share with his people. This man, Jonah, you know that he was sent by God. Uh, to go to warn people to, to repent uh, for their sins. But Jonah says, uh, starting saying no or trying to, to do not go. Uh, but after he accepted and you know the story, and then he went well God sent him and then he, when Jonah said uh, went there and then you know people repent and you know what happened and people came back to God and God forgave them the word of God that God gave to me too uh, God told me that I, I need to come and tell his people we are in the time like Nineveh. We need to, uh, to, to repent. I know our pastor teaches about repenting. It's not easy to share this message, but trust me, God gave me this message to tell you it's time to repent. We are in the time as Nineveh. I, I was so amazed how uh, last past week, past our pastor and the other pastor was preaching, and they, they was mentioning about repenting. That was confirmation for me that God gave me so I can go and give the message. 
Imana yari yabwiye yona yuko ibyaha by'abantu byirundanyije bikagira imbere yayo As God as God told Jonah that people have been been doing a lot of bad stuff and then God is so mad about it that's how God is saying right now that's not that's how God told me this is how it is in this time we are in the hard time as a Christian it's time to pray hard this time every Christian should kneel down and pray hard uh, people have been sinning as if it's normal. A lot of bad stuff been happening, and we see it at school, everywhere in whole, everywhere we go. And then people take it as if it's normal. Uh, so as a Christian, we need to pray hard. I thank God that he brought me at this church. So we can help each other to pray hard. We can pray for our church, for our families, for our country because we are in the hard time. This is, comes as a warning as, uh, to a Christian. We are about to go in the hard time. And the, 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 the blessed people are the ones who are staying on their knees, who are praying hard, because they will be able to sustain in that hard time. Other than that, as a Christian, this is a warning. We need to go on our knees and pray hard. Uh, let me show you the sign that God gave it to me. So I God gave me revelation. He, he uh, was sleeping and then he, he gave me a, rev, a revelation. I saw an, a, a heaven uh, sign. It was a big, big, big papers like wallpaper like this, and and open up. And God told me read this word, and then uh, it was in my language and in English. After, after I read it, uh, uh, the wallpaper uh, turns around. And it falls down and fall in the front of me. And then God told me, go and pick it up that wallpaper. And God told me, take this wallpaper and make this word written on, on something and take it in every church. Every Christian need to see this and need to have wake up call. So let me show you the, those words are uh, these. This is the words that uh, God gave to her. And there was even the Bible verses. That's why we read it. I believe you can read it. He say, the evil that destroys is coming. Repent, repent, repent. It's Isaiah 55, 6 and 7. That's what God. That's how it was written, and then they told me to give it to the Church of God. I beg you, my brethren. This is not an easy word to share. This is very hard words to share with the church of God. I know it's not easy for now to focus on God so hard because the time we are in and the world. But with all in all, with the, with the power of the spirits of God, it's possible. We can, pull, we can focus on God and put our heart on God. Pray for our kids, pray for everything. Uh, 
Thank you so much, but I have this last word that uh, uh, can help us to stay focused that uh, God told me to left with you. It's Galatian 5. Uh, 16 to 18 says, uh, antagonized to each other so that you are not free but you are prevented from doing what you desire to do. Amen. Amen. Yeah. I am done. God bless you. Thank you. So one of the things that we can do I think in a, in a in our in our broken way of thinking is what we'll try to do with a word from the Lord is we'll try to unpack it a bunch and then try to understand it like it's I want to be careful about massaging what she said too much because if she feels the Lord has given her that word and she shares it you know, the spirit of the prophet is subject to the prophets, right? So we, we test the word. She had a lot of scripture in there, a lot of direct quotes from the word of God to his people, to people that were living in sin. And so before we get into this mindset of like, let me just unpack this and swirl it around in my mind and digest a little bit, as opposed to simply responding, just responding. Because one thing that... that Josie said is, is that we're going around in sin like it's normal. And that is, I'm not, I'm not here to browbeat, you know, and she's not doing that either, but that's, that's the nature of the world that we live in. We just move in that direction. It will gently pull you downstream, and before you know it, you're into all kinds of stuff that you're, it becomes normal for you, for me. And so what I want to do is, is move this into what I was going to share this morning, although I'll abbreviate what I was going to share. And then at the end, what I want us to do, or I want to invite you to do, is to simply sing with me and enter into a time of prayer and repentance before the Lord. Now, like Josie said, you can pray for the country, you can pray for you know, your loved ones, if you're like me, my, my heart immediately goes to myself. What, where are the areas of my life that I need to repent of? And I think that God did this this morning like he always does, right? It's his church. But through the song lyrics that were sung, through this word, and then what I have on my heart this morning, I think it'll lead us right there. You know, a few weeks ago, we talked about fear and anxiety, and I walked you through four weeks of that, but I left it short. There's a, there's a tail end of that portion of scripture where he talks about what we're supposed to be thinking about and focusing on for the peace of God to enter into our hearts and minds. And he separates hearts and minds. Paul does that on purpose hearts and minds, what we love and what we think about. For the peace of God to come, we have to focus on the right things. And let me, let me just read this for you this morning and, and lead you where I believe the Lord is taking us in response to this word. Philippians 4 says this, Rejoice in the Lord always, I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all, the Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds. Finally, brethren, 
Whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. In these times that Josie referred to, these crazy times we're living in, I I never thought I would see our country go to a place that it's in right now, where the level of open defiance of who God is in the streets, like an antagonism toward the things of God. I mean, a man was preaching in Glendale, what, two days ago, and was shot while he was preaching on the side of the street. A guy just came up and shot him for preaching. It's, I'm not a fear monger. I don't, you know, get up here and talk about, well, we need to, but if you look around, like the frog in the kettle, the waters are getting warmer, and we're like, what is happening? And what is the people of God's response to that? How do we respond? I think the first place we have to look is at ourselves. Where are we with the Lord? This peace that's promised to us. Many of us walk around all the time and we're, we, don't, we don't walk in peace. We're just as anxious or wound up as everybody else. We're just as, spending just as much time on Facebook or YouTube watching the clips of whatever and getting all worked up just like everybody else. But that's not what God has for us. It says don't be anxious about anything. This word actually means to be torn up, to torn into pieces, debilitated by worry and fear. And verse 11 and 12 says, and I didn't go all the way there, but Paul says in the midst of every situation that he was in, and he was in prison, he said, I've learned to be content whatever the circumstances are. Paul had this ability, and I didn't say talent, ability, a learned ability to be content in the midst of any situation. Now, there's a big difference between pretending something's not happening or ignoring it and being content in the midst of dire circumstances. Paul had that. He said he learned it. He didn't say, I'm tough. That's where a lot of us go, especially us men. I need to buck up. I need to toughen up. I need to buy a Glock. I'll be ready. It's not Paul's talent. It's not his toughness. He's not tougher than the rest of us. He learned something. He learned something. He learned that peace is not just the absence of fear. It's the presence of something else in the midst of the circumstances. The presence of God. He didn't say, don't think about it. Stop thinking about it. He said, think about these things instead. So, what do you think about? What do you spend your days thinking about? Paul's encouragement is to do what? Think about what is true, what is noble, what is right, what is pure. Think about these things and the God of peace will be with you. What does that mean? Every time Paul uses these particular words in the Greek, he's talking about God. He's talking about God's plan for the world. He's talking about sin and about Christ and about salvation, about the world and human nature and God's plan for the world and his plan of salvation. That's what he's talking about. So when you think about noble things, pure things, right things, you're thinking about godly things, God's plan, God's heart, your own sin and his salvation. This is not what we're taught about anxiety and stress and how to get peace. We're taught techniques. Go relax. Get a work-life balance. Learn how to control negative thoughts and emotions. Paul's like, okay, I'm not saying go think about 
relaxation techniques. I'm telling you to think about the right things. Instead of me filling my mind with the things of this world, and I'm not talking about just sinful stuff. I'm talking about just all of the news that is out there that gets me anxious. Where's my thought life on the things of God? Let's talk about peace for a second. I think there's smart peace and there's stupid peace. Stupid peace, we'll call that numbing out. Stupid peace is three shots of Jack Daniels. Stupid peace is a couple edibles. Stupid peace is sex with somebody you're not married to. Stupid peace is pornography. Stupid peace is Percocet. Those all give you a measure of peace in the moment. But you're denying the reality that's around you. You're escaping from it. You're numbing out. You're running away from it. Like, I I don't want to deal with all this stuff anymore. Instead of numbing out, what about, I just thought of this. What about numbing in? Where we're like, okay, I, I realize all this garbage around me. I see it. The brokenness of the world, the brokenness of my own heart, the brokenness in my family, whatever it would be. Instead of running away from it in escapism and numbing out, we go in and we go, okay, go, what is going on in me? What am I thinking about? The second thing he says is to give thanks. Think about the right things and then to give thanks. <laughs> Your prayers as you present them before God with thanksgiving. Now, when I read that, I think, oh, I'm going to thank you whenever the prayer gets answered. That's not what he's saying. He's saying, as we're praying, even in a few moments, as we pray, we're thanking God for what he's doing. Can you guys hear me okay? Is, are we awake this morning? I know, it's like, what? Actual church? Oh, my word. I can't handle this. Talking about repentance? Oh, my word. Should I thank him in the midst of the request? Why would I do that? Why would I turn to God and thank him in the midst of a request, even if it's desperation? Why? Because he knows everything. Romans 8, 28, if you love God, God is working everything together for good in your life. Romans 8, 28 says that. Absolutely everything, even the bad things, even the things he hates, even the things he didn't put in this world. God didn't design this world to be full of brokenness and sorrow. Do you know that? Can I get an amen? He did not design this world to be full of brokenness and sorrow. He didn't make it that way. We made it that way. We keep making it that way. When I tap my brakes on the freeway, when a guy's tailing me, I'm making it that way. He says, if you love God, God is working it all together for good in your life. That's abstract. I know. Let me give you a concrete one. Imagine Christ on the cross and imagine all the people around him. Imagine being there and you're like, this is the worst possible thing that could ever happen. This guy was doing so much good, he healed people, he fed thousands, such a wise teacher, and now they're killing him. From our perspective, it looks like the absolute worst thing that could happen, but what we were looking at, if our eyes went there, was the single greatest event God had ever done in the history of the universe. The redemption of the world was taking place in that moment of utter chaos and destruction. So when you pray with thanksgiving, 
God says, when a child of mine makes a request, I will always give that person, always give that person what he or she would have asked if they knew everything that I know. If you knew everything that he knew. And lastly, he talks about what we love. What we think about, that's our mind, right? Think on these things. But look at the rest of the list. He says, to ponder these things, whatever is lovely, admirable, whatever is excellent, this is attraction, this is, this is love. So he goes from our mind, what we think about, to our heart. What are you in love with? It's not enough just to think about the right things. It's important to love the right thing. Paul says he learned this. Autokia is the Greek word. It means independent of circumstances. It means to have poise. It means to have this power not to be upset or devastated or melted down or freaking out over anything. Always poised. What do you love? I think as Christians we can get off track in one of two ways. One is what we love out there. So many things that want our affection. So many people on reality TV clamoring for our audience. Their own brokenness being fed by our allegiance. That's easy. What about what we love in here? Out there is one thing. In here is another. And Christians, we get caught up in being good. Becoming a better person. Being more virtuous. I'm getting better. I'm working harder. I'm getting my thought life under control. And we begin to love this idea of like, I'm doing it. I'm doing it. St. Augustine, this amazing philosopher and theologian from the third and fourth centuries, talks about this a lot in his book, Confessions. And he, he nails it on the head because he says that your pursuit of virtue will eventually lead you astray. You should only love one thing, and that which is immutable. That's what he says. Only love what's immutable. Think about the worst thing that could happen to you. What would be the worst thing? To me, shark attack would be one. I mean, death by shark attack. I don't mean like, oh, you know, a nibble. I mean a violent death by shark attack. Burned alive. The worst possible thing that could probably happen to us is a violent death. What's the one thing you can love that you will get closer to in a violent death? That which is immutable. I'll quote St. Augustine here. Confessions, book four. None of these I love when I love my God. And yet I love a kind of light, melody, fragrance, meat, and embracement when I love my God. The light, melody, fragrance, meat, embracement of my inner man. Where there shineth into my soul what space cannot contain. And there soundeth what time beareth not away. And there smelleth what breathing disperseth not. And there tasteth what eating diminisheth not. This is which I love when I love my God. The way to get peace, tranquility, poise is to love him supremely. 
Last thought. Now you're dismissed. Go love what is immutable. <laughs> All right, I'm on it. We can stop there. That'd be a certain kind of sermon. Not my favorite. How do I go love what's immutable? I'd love to do that. I try, but I'm not really feeling it. It's because it's too abstract for us. It's too, go love God. But Paul does something really amazing here. He says, the peace of God, which keeps your hearts and minds, not just in God, but in Christ Jesus, he says. Christ Jesus. He separates hearts and minds, but he says, the peace of God in Christ Jesus. Jesus. Now, Josie earlier talked about wickedness in Nineveh, and the Bible backs this up, of course, in the book of Jonah. Also in Isaiah 57, it says that there's no peace for the wicked, right? Now, does that mean God hates evildoers? God loves everyone. He hates evil. But what Isaiah 57 is talking about is just natural consequence. Like, if you're walking in wickedness, you will not be at peace. You won't. In fact, some of the most unhappy people that I know, and when I'm the most unhappiest, is when I'm trying to do both, trying to love the other stuff and still have peace. And what happens? We're restless, anxious, God says that your life is going to be like a tossing sea, restless, constantly casting up mire and mud because your house is like a house built on sand instead of the rock. Let me bring us home. This restlessness and unease and anxiety, and fear, and getting worked up that you're experiencing, it's not a matter of just triumphing over that. That is the pursuit of virtue. That is like, I'm gonna be a good person. I'm gonna get it done. I'm gonna think the right thing. I'm gonna get over this hump. What we need to remember, and what is critical for us as Christians, is this lack of peace was paid for, was paid for. Imagine Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, and when he's in the Garden of Gethsemane, if he had the mindset, well, if I just focus on the things of God, my Father, if I just stay focused on him, everything's gonna be okay. That's not what happened on the cross. In fact, it says that Jesus cried out with a loud voice. He cried out, why have you forsaken me? He cried it out. Now, there's a great commentary on the book of Mark by a guy named Bill Lane. And he talks about this cry. He calls it the cry of dereliction. Cry of dereliction. He says that crucified criminals ordinarily suffer complete exhaustion. For long periods, they were unconscious before they died. The stark realism of Mark's account describes a sudden, violent death. A cry of dereliction from Jesus expresses unfathomable pain. So the pain that Jesus is experiencing on the cross for us isn't just physical pain. Paul says that he treated him as sin who knew no sin. He didn't make Jesus a sinner, but all the punishment of sin was on him. So this cry of dereliction was all the results of all the sin, all the lack of peace, all the helplessness, all the worry, all the fretting, all the anxiety, all the guilt, all the shame, all of that was on Jesus at once. And so that cry of dereliction, that cry of just, God, where are you? He knew no peace. because the judgment of God was upon him. 
But before you go out and you try to love the everlasting one, it is through Jesus because of what he did on the cross for us. It's all through him. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face and the things of this world go faintly dim in light of his glory and grace. Let me give you one practical example. How many of you have heard of Horatio Spafford before? Not a guy we talk about very much, right? He was an American lawyer who lost everything in the Chicago fire, 1871. Just two years later, he sent his wife Anna and their four daughters on a ship across the Atlantic Ocean for a trip. On its way, this ship collided with another ship and began to sink. As it was sinking, Anna, the mother, gathered the four daughters together and said, let's pray. And so they prayed as the ship was going down. The ship went under the water and they were all scattered into the waves, all five of them. All four little girls drowned. Anna was found unconscious by a rescue ship just floating in the water, unconscious. They rescued her. They took her to England. She cabled Horatio Spafford, her husband, with just two words, saved alone. Saved alone. Horatio Spafford immediately got on a ship to go to England to be with his wife. And on the way there, he began to write a hymn. This is the hymn we're going to sing in just a moment. In fact, I'll have Joya and the team join me. That'd be great. A man dealing with grief, seeking the peace of God, peace like a river. He writes this hymn, and he spends the entire hymn focusing on Jesus. Focusing on his sinfulness that was forgiven. That's what he writes the hymn about after losing his four daughters. How does somebody do that? How does somebody do that when their four little girls are dead? Everything is gone. How do you write a hymn about sin and forgiveness? Most of us would go to this place, well, maybe I'm being punished. Horatio didn't go there. Why? He looked at the cross. I'm not being punished. Jesus was punished on my behalf. Maybe God doesn't care about me. Maybe he's abandoned me. No, look what he did for me. Look what he did on the cross to show his love for me. In fact, the Bible would respond back to Horatio, and he knew this, and that's how he wrote this hymn. God says, I've lost a child too, but not involuntarily, voluntarily, for your sake, Horatio lost a child so he writes this hymn my sin oh the bliss of this glorious thought my sin not in part but the whole is nailed to the cross and I bear it no more praise the Lord praise the Lord oh my soul when peace like a river attendeth my way when sorrows like sea billows roll Whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. I don't know how you came in this morning. I don't know what you were dealing with. I'm sure it was weighty. I want to talk to you about your soul for a minute. All these other things you're trying to love so diligently. They will never satisfy you. There's only one that satisfies the immutable. There's only one that can fill us with peace that transcends the world's understanding. Thinking about him thanking him as we pray, 
and loving him. So let's do this. Joya, would you come join me out here? And we're going to sing It Is Well. And the words of this song are perfect for where Josie led us this morning, and then this word as it ties in. That in spite of all the circumstances around us, in spite of whatever's going on in your life, we have cause for repentance, we have cause for gratitude. And we, call, we have cause for the glorification of Jesus Christ because in the midst of all of it, he went to the cross to forgive your sins. Amen? He went to the cross to see you free, set free from the lures and the loves of this world to love him and him alone. So if you've deviated from that, if you're in love with something else, if you're in love with your phone, repent this morning. Repent. If God brings other areas to your mind that you need to repent of, repent of those. Just go to your knees and go before him as you sing, it is well with my soul, and thank him that he's forgiving you in the moment because Jesus Christ took those sins to the cross. Would you stand with me this morning? I want to pray and and then Joy is going to lead us in this song. And I just want to encourage you as you sing, just open your heart up before the Lord. Father, we come before you this morning humbly with hearts full of gratitude. You saw us afar off and you ran to us, Father. Like the prodigal son or daughter, you ran. Many of us in this room, Lord, are in dire need of repentance this morning. We've fallen in love with other things. But the frog in the kettle and the water got warm and we didn't even notice. And now as we take a cold, hard look at our own hearts, where our affections are, what we think about, we are just lost. So Lord, receive our prayers this morning. Hear the cries of our hearts. Fill us with your spirit as you forgive us of our sins and welcome us back to your table this morning. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Let's sing together. When peace like a river attendeth my
with my soul. It is well, it is well with my soul. It is well, it is well with my soul. Thank you, Jesus. God, we're sorry for looking to these other frail things to fulfill us. God, we're sorry for looking to entertainment and our spouses, the hope of love, alcohol, drugs, the internet. Giving our allegiance, our hearts, our minds over to the things of this world. Forgive me, Lord. Wash 
wash my heart and make it new. Take this heart that is hardened. And make it fleshy again. This fruit of the Spirit that we long and strive for, love, joy, peace, kindness, gentleness, self-control that we work hard at, Lord, we know that that is a fruit of a life that abides in you. We choose this morning, I choose this morning to re-abide in you. Give me strength and courage to say no, strength and courage to choose you again and again. Lord, I pray for your people that the enemy would not be able to twist your words this morning. I pray for your people, like that word, guard your hearts and minds. It's like an army camped around you. We sleep well because we have a good army. We sleep well because you're guarding our hearts and minds. So God, guard these hearts and minds. Let the words you have spoken to your people take root and flourish. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We worship you, Lord Jesus. We're going to give a few minutes here for the prayer team to come forward, and if you want some additional prayer, we want to give space for that. I'm going to dismiss everybody else because we have a congregational meeting that will start in about seven minutes. So I'm going to dismiss you and ask you to exit to the lobby and then come back in for the congregational meeting so we can get a proper head count for that meeting. If you consider Eastside to be your home church, then this congregational meeting is for you. If you're a visitor, thank you so much for being with us today. You can eavesdrop on a congregational meeting if you want to. But thank you for being with us this morning. Have a great week, you guys.